Amen. Last week, we considered Hebrews eleven seventeen through 22, which is the final word in this chapter on the faith of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Joseph. Those whose stories take up the entire end and really the majority of the book of Genesis, Genesis 12 through 50. We spend time focusing on their faith, which is the theme and the main focus of Hebrews chapter 11. And what we saw in each of them was that they trusted God, taking God at his word. And that really is a good way to describe faith generically. Faith, true faith, a grace, a gift from God himself, which is worked in us by the Spirit. Faith takes God at every word. That's what faith is is and not just the promises but all of God's word God's word in its entirety every word that comes from the mouth of God from Genesis now to Revelation to say it in a different way faith receives the word of God about God about the incomprehensible and invisible God who he is what he does has done is doing will do and so on Faith receives and believes the word of God, not just about God, but about us, about mankind, the fourfold estate of man. We receive the word of God about man, which says that we were created upright and good in covenant relationship with God. But now, because of Adam, who's our federal head, Adam, who sins and falls, we now in him are born as sinners, guilty and corrupted doing nothing but sin from the womb, nothing but unrighteousness and unable to do otherwise because we are dead in our sins apart from Christ and the work of the Spirit. We don't seek God and we are, worst of all, cut off from the life that is in God, restless and rebellious, seeking to satisfy our hearts with worldly things while on a trajectory toward hell, eternal suffering, the second death, away from the presence of God in body and soul forever. That's the second estate of man, the estate of sin and misery. And this is the estate of all men born in Adam. And that is all men, except for Christ himself. And we will die and perish in Adam unless we turn to Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible says. We must turn to Jesus Christ, receiving and resting in him as Savior, as the one who came living and dying and rising again to secure salvation for his people. Redemption accomplished. The one who came fulfilling all of the demands of his perfectly righteous Father in heaven. Right? This is the gospel. The good news for rebellious sinners who turn away from sin and toward Christ by faith. And faith, this is the point, faith receives all of that as it comes from the mouth of God through the word of God. Spirit wrought faith receives the entirety of God's word, not just the parts we like. All of it. And faith most principally unites us to Christ, that we might receive him and all of his benefits. We might be counted as righteous and forgiven. That's justification. That we might go from being sons of the devil, sons of the serpent, to sons and daughters of God. That's adoption. That we might be, over time, transformed into the likeness of this son. That is sanctification. And then when we die, being immediately with him. And finally, at the end, when he returns raised in glory, fit for communion with God in Christ, in a new creation, life without end, a realm wherein the Spirit himself will be the very air that we breathe, which, as Meredith Klein says, is the secret of immortality. You see, the word of God gives us all of these things, all of these truths, and therefore faith receives all of what has been said this morning so far. But now, last week, we saw that Joseph was a model of this very faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph we're all models of this very faith, a faith that receives the word of God and lives by it, every word. And we know this because in verse 22, we're told that he makes mention, as he comes to the end of his life, he makes mention of a future 
Exodus. Now, what in the world is this? Well, this is a time in the future when God would raise up Moses, who shows up, actually, the next section of Hebrews. Moses, the man who would come at God's command and get God's people out of Egypt, that they might be taken out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the land of promise, the land that was promised to Abraham generations prior. This is Joseph's faith on display. It's, it's the great chapter of faith, and Joseph is mentioned because of his faith, as he takes God at his word. But how do we know that? Where, where does Joseph get this idea of a coming exodus? Well, he actually learned it from his father, Jacob. In Genesis 48, 21, this is what Jacob says to Joseph as he's about to die. He says, behold, I'm about to die. But God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. You see, Joseph gets it from Jacob, his father. But what is the ultimate source of this word about the coming exodus, the coming rescue of God through Moses? Well, the ultimate source is God himself. And we can trace it all the way back to Abraham and Genesis 15, where God himself makes this promise. The very promise to which Joseph is clinging at the end of his life. In Genesis 15, 13 through 14, we read this. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. That's Egypt. He's telling Abraham, your children will be sojourners ultimately in Egypt. They will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. That's how long, four centuries of suffering and affliction. But here's the promise. I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. This is where it begins. This is ultimately where Joseph gets this idea of the upcoming exodus in the future. And therefore, Joseph's mention of the Exodus was his taking God at his word, a word given to Abraham, passed on to Isaac and Jacob, and then to Joseph himself. And therefore, this mention of the Exodus was a profession of faith. This is why he is mentioned here in this great chapter on faith. And most of this is review. We talked about it last week. But there is an added element here that we didn't talk about. And that is the entire context of Joseph's life where he exercised this faith. And this added element, this context, I think, makes the faith of Joseph shine even brighter. The context serves as a black backdrop that makes us wonder how in the world Joseph could have possibly endured holding fast to his great confession, holding fast to the word of God, which he loved. And so now I want us to move on, not, not from Joseph's faith altogether, but the context in which he exercises this faith, the context in which he trusts the Lord. And that context is his story. And it's a story that is told from Genesis 37 through 50. And we begin already back in Genesis to get a, a hint of how the story is going to go. What his life is going to be like when we read this in Genesis 37, 3 and 4. It says, now Israel, that is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many collars. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. That's how the story begins. His brothers hate him. But then following this, Joseph has two dreams and his entire family in these dreams is shown to be bowing down to him which is a prophetic revelation of what's going to happen in Egypt in the years to come when he actually becomes the right-hand man to Pharaoh, the Lord of Egypt. But he tells his family about this dream. And it just makes things even worse, as you would expect. 
The dreams only fuel the brother's hatred and jealousy. And the jealousy and hatred grow so fierce that his brothers actually plot to murder him. <coughs> Genesis thirty-seven eighteen. They, that is the brothers, saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. But the brothers couldn't agree on how to do that. Exactly. And so what happens is they end up selling him to the Ishmaelites. And it's the Ishmaelites who essentially, eventually take him down to Egypt. And so that's how Joseph actually gets to Egypt in the first place. It's a story of sin. The sin of his brothers who hate him and betray him and hand him over to wicked nations. It's a story of suffering, a story of murder plots and sheer wickedness. In other words, the context is a painful context. It is a painful story and life. And to make matters even worse, if that's not bad enough, once Joseph gets to Egypt, he's sold to a man named Potiphar. He's working for him. And this man is a captain of the guard. He's kind of a big deal in Egypt. And Potiphar's wife, a wicked woman finds Joseph attractive. And so she tries to seduce him while Joseph is a servant working in that house. But Joseph, a man of God, he flees. Joseph's a man of God who will obey God, who will trust in the Lord even in exile as a pilgrim in Egypt. He flees and she catches his garment as he flees. And so what does she do? Well, she calls for her husband and lies. And she says that he was trying to seduce her, but then he ran off and so she got his garment. And as a result of this lie, the lie of a wicked woman, Joseph now ends up in Egyptian prison for maybe 10 to 12 years. And only after all of that is Joseph raised up to the right hand of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, that he might be a kind of savior, as we'll see. So what's the point? The point is that's the context of Joseph's faith. It is, it is no cakewalk. His life of faith was not roses and butterflies, but his life was a life of misery, pain, and grief. It was a life of prolonged suffering, physical and spiritual, a life full of agony and betrayal. Joseph was hated and he was despised by those closest to him. He was a, a man of sorrows. He, as the beloved son, was taken away from his father whom he dearly loved and he didn't even get to say goodbye. He went out to talk to his brothers, thinking he would return again to his normal life. And yet they plot to kill him. Then they sell him off, and he ends up in Egyptian prison. He's unjustly exiled to a foreign land, imprisoned for something he didn't even do. The context is nothing but tragedy and darkness. And you would think, wouldn't you, in this moment, that he would eventually give up. You would think that there would be a time when he would stop crying out, How long, O oh Lord? And you would think that he would just stop believing. That he would just give in to the idea of nothingness. Mere existence. Meaninglessness. Coincidence. Luck. Chance. And yet, don't miss this. Here in Hebrews 11, he is listed as a model believer to the end. Isn't that amazing? Which means what? It means that in all of this betrayal, in all of this pain, in all of this suffering, in all of this sin and misery, he never lost the faith. He never stopped clinging to God's word. To use Pauline language, which is a bit anachronistic by, you know, 
centuries. He fought the good fight. He waged warfare. He kept the faith and a crown was laid up for him in heaven. And in this way, in this context, he becomes an incredible example for the Hebrews themselves. Because don't forget, a chapter back in chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews mentions their very suffering, their affliction, their pain that they must endure, holding fast to their good confession of faith. In Hebrews 10.32, the writer says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, that is, you believed the gospel, You endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prisons and you in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you yourselves knew that you had a better possession and an abiding one, a heavenly one, an eternal one. Therefore, in the midst of all of your suffering and affliction, the plundering of your property, all of your misery, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Do you see how Joseph becomes a model, a perfect model for these suffering saints who must endure to the end? The Hebrews were suffering, and so did Joseph, making him a prime example worthy of imitation. They needed, and we need to be encouraged to imitate this life and faith, to endure to the end. Because as Jesus says, those who endure to the end will be saved. Not those who endure partway. Not those who endure almost to the end. But those who endure to the telos. The end. The finish line. They will be saved. Joseph is a model of what it looks like to walk by faith even in the fire. And what was sustaining Joseph through all of this? It's very basic. His hope was in the word of God and in the God of the word. Joseph was clinging to the word of God given to him. But not only did Joseph believe that he would be taken out of Egypt eventually with all of God's people. But understand this. Sustaining him throughout this life of misery and pain and suffering was what he knew about God. He knew that the providential hand of the Lord was in all of his pain and suffering, that all things were being worked out for good with a purpose. And therefore, he knew that none of his pain, none of his suffering, none of the agony, not even the sin was meaningless. He says it himself. Once he's been raised up in Egypt and once his family comes to Egypt for food during a famine, This is what he says. This is what we're told. Genesis 45, 4 through 8. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you. Do you feel the weight of that? God sent me before you to preserve you, you betrayers. For you, a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you, many survivors. So it's not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. You understand, he does not forget the fact that his brothers sold him. He says it. You did sell me, brothers. You did sin against me. You did act wickedly and cause me much pain and suffering. But fundamentally, God sent me here. God sent me here to be a kind of savior and Lord that Israel, his 
chosen people might be preserved. In other words, in all the pain and suffering and all that's happening, Joseph actually sees that God is the main actor. God is the one who ordained this humiliation and all of this suffering and all of this betrayal and even all of this sin. And then the exaltation. I use those words on purpose. Humiliation and exaltation. Joseph is raised up to the right hand of Pharaoh, a kind of God. God was working all things according to the counsel of his own perfect will. And Joseph sums all of this up at the very end when he tells his brothers in Genesis 50, 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. It does not say you meant evil against me, but God used it for good. It does not say that. And don't make it say that. But the Hebrew word is the exact same in both places. You had a meaning in all of this, you wicked betraying brothers. But God had a meaning in the same exact events. And what was it? To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Therefore, see and understand that it was the the future hope found in the word of God regarding the exodus. And it was God's secret, sovereign, sustaining, and governing of all things that we call his providence, which keeps Joseph from despair. In other words, his theology was his life. Some people want to belittle theology, like theology is what Charles Hodge does. This is what happens at Old Princeton. This is what Voss does and Bovink does and Klein does. No, you must be little theologians or you will perish. You must believe rightly or you will not endure to the end. You see that? It is the theology that is undergirding Joseph that sustains him in all of his pain. To use the language of William Cooper, Joseph understood that God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. And that behind every frowning providence for the people of God, there is a hidden smile. So see that Joseph suffered so much, and yet also see, brothers and sisters, he never used his suffering once as an excuse to walk away from the Lord. Isn't that amazing? But instead, his suffering, his pain, all the sin around him and his own sin, everything that's happening, it actually presses him closer to the Lord. As he focuses on the fact that God is in absolute control and that God keeps his word and that God cannot do otherwise. And that God has his reasons for all that was happening to Joseph. Can you imagine being an Arminian, an Egyptian prison? I mean, seriously. All of this is meaningless. All these people have their own free will. I have my own free will. Where is God? He can't do anything about this because he's going to get in the way of their will. Joseph was a Calvinist. As was Jesus, as was Paul, as was. This sustained him. Throughout the story, a story riddled with sin and suffering and all the darkness. Joseph believed the word of God and he believed that God was in absolute control, even of the will of all men. And not only that, but Joseph knew and understood that even there in the deepest Dark of night, God was with him. There's a refrain constantly throughout the end of Genesis. And that refrain is the Lord was with Joseph. God did not become Emmanuel in the New Testament. God is Emmanuel from Genesis 1-2. When the spirit comes down into the visible world and hovers as the archetypal model for man. God with us. God is always with his people. The Lord was there with him, in him, sustaining him, holding him up with his sovereign right hand, fueling the fire of his faith with the never-ending supply of the Spirit. 
all for his very good purposes, his saving purposes, in such a way that Joseph, even in the bottom of Egyptian prison, in the darkest night of his soul, he can say with the psalmist, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. God was with him. And God raised him up to be a kind of savior to the people. And understand, brothers and sisters, that everything that I have just said about Joseph, what was true for Joseph, what is sustaining Joseph, it is also true for us as God's people. We too are God's people in the same covenant of grace as Joseph, with the same spirit who was in Joseph. And therefore, we too are empowered by God himself, by the Spirit, to walk by every word that comes from the mouth of God in faith. That's what faith is, while trusting in the omnipotent providence of God. This is our life. It is to be our life. The writer of Hebrews has already said this in various ways, exhorting us now, as Joseph's in Egypt, to hold fast, to trust in the Lord, clinging to his word. He is constantly telling us to hold fast to the good confession, enduring until we receive the promise. Peter himself says this kind of thing in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. He too mentions faith in the fire. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, Christians, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. This is our life. We are surrounded by pain and misery and suffering and sin, other sin and our own sin. We must endure by faith through it all. James says the same, James 1, 3, and 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That's convicting, isn't it? You spend a whole Lord's Day meditating on that. Because what happens when various trials come our way? What is our immediate response? Joy, wrong, grumbling, complaining, why me, pity party. But James says, count it all joy. Rejoice. Yes. Here comes the trial. Here comes the fire. Why? Why, why joy? Not because you love trials. Does anyone just love trials? You're weird. <laughs> no. No, we rejoice because of what the trials do. He says, he continues on, James one, well, that was two. This is verse three. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, endurance, pressing on. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's why we rejoice. Or as Paul says, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for you a weight of glory. The trials are never meaningless, but God in his providential sustaining and governing uses them to to perfect us, to perfect our faith, that we might, in fact, endure in faith to the end. This is the life in the wilderness for the people of God. We're in the fire, trials and tests and suffering all around us. Family turmoil, trouble in the church, but not here. Troubles with children, culture, chaos on every side. And worst of all, your own indwelling sin that haunts you every second of every day. That's our life. And yet we do not give up. We do not press on, seeing with Joseph that all of this fire from the hand of our sovereign Lord serves not to destroy our faith, but to refine it, to perfect, to perfect it, proving it to be true and genuine until the end when faith gives way to sight. In other words, the fire is the context for faith, and that was true for Joseph, and it's true for all of us. It is the place wherein we are tested, the context in which we must press on, trusting until we enter glory, knowing that it is all from the Lord. But here's the problem. We will do this imperfectly. 
We will doubt. We will grumble. You will grumble. I grumble. We will sin. We will call God into question. We might even doubt God's goodness, his wisdom, his will, his justice, and none of it is okay. We might even get angry with God in the fire. And hear me, it is never okay to be angry with God. Never. And what is all of that? It's sin. And what is the wage of sin? Death. So what does this teach us? This teaches us that if I send you home right now, I am doing more harm than I am good for you. Because you might this morning, right now, if I just wrapped it up, you might walk away thinking that your chief goal, your main endeavor right now is to imitate the faith of another. But brothers and sisters, that will lead you straight to hell. You are not saved by imitating the faith of another. Something else is needed. As we think about the story of Scripture, and I say this all the time, yes, we see that Joseph is a model believer. And we ought to see that in Hebrews 11, he is being put forth as a model believer. He is the point of the text. But understand that Joseph functions as a picture. Joseph, a real human being who really lived and suffered, humiliated and exalted, he is pointing beyond himself to the only one who actually can save us. And this really is where all of Hebrews 11 is driving. All of these model believers, including Joseph, they all point beyond themselves. Abel, Enoch, Noah, they're all types They all point beyond themselves to the only perfect pilgrim who came in perfect faith, never sinning, perfectly living by every word that came from the mouth of his father in our place. And who is that? It is the beloved son. The one of a kind son who also was betrayed, rejected by his own brothers and his people. And even his disciples handed over and sold like trash by Judas. One unjustly handed over unto death for no reason, for no sin, for no law breaking. A man of sorrows who was obedient in perfect faith to the point of death for us. That he might bear the curse of sin and death in our place. And that is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the eschatological Joseph. He is the one who faithfully and perfectly lives and believes in the fire. And he is the object of our faith, the one to whom we look for salvation. And this is where everything is leading. This is why there's a part of me, don't take offense, there's a part of me that just hates chapters and verses. Because it destroys the way we read the Bible sometimes. But think about this. What do we see in the opening of Hebrews chapter 12? Mm -hmm. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and that's all of Hebrews 11. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, not Joseph, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, that's humiliation, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That is his exaltation. So do you see what's happening in Hebrews 11? It's like a slow mountain climb, isn't it? It's as if all of these biblical characters are directing our attention up and up and up and up until we get to the top of the mountain and who there is standing at the top of the mountain, the one to whom all of these characters pointed from below, the answer is Jesus Christ. 
The one who came down from heaven, heaven, suffered, endured, was crucified, buried, raised, and exalted, not to the right hand of a king on earth, but to the right hand of God himself in heaven. And in all of this living and dying, how did he do it? By faith. By faith. Perfect faith, which makes him a perfect model of faith. And yet even more a perfect savior. Thomas Goodwin points this out in his collected works. In a writing called Christ Set Forth. He puts Christ forth as a model believer and as the object of justifying faith. Listen to what he says. He says, for in this example of Christ we have the highest instance of believing faith that ever was. This example of Christ may teach and incite us to believe. For did Christ lay down all his glory and empty himself and leave himself worth nothing, but made a deed of surrendering all he had into his father's hands, and this, and a pure trust that God would justify many by him? And shall we not lay down all that we have and part with whatever is dear unto us? Like a, like a, with a like submission, and a dependence and hope of being ourselves justified by him? You see, Joseph, yes, is a model believer worthy of our imitation. And this is true of everyone listed in Hebrews 11, but there's something even more going on here because imitation is not enough. We are not saved by imitation. We are not saved by imitating Joseph or the greater Joseph. We're not saved by imitating Christ who is the perfect pilgrim and the model believer who lived with perfect faith. No, we must look beyond Joseph, beyond ourselves, and we must think beyond imitation to imputation. We must look to Christ, the model believer, the son of God and the son of man who was perfectly obedient in faith, perfectly obedient to the point of death on a cross in faith bearing the wrath of his own father in faith, being buried in faith, trusting that he would be raised from the dead and given the reward promised to him by the father before the foundation of the world. We must be united to this one who is perfect in the execution of faith that we too might be counted as righteous, perfect, counted as having never (laughs) sinned, forgiven, of all of our sins and no longer destined for wrath, that we might be counted also as perfect pilgrims, as those united to the perfect pilgrim, Jesus Christ. In other words, our eyes are to follow the ascending mountain of Hebrews 11 to the very top where Christ himself appears in the opening of Hebrews 12. And that is where we rest. In him, we rest. But now as I close, let me encourage you. Yes, throw yourself upon Jesus Christ by faith if you have not. And yes, imitate Joseph as a model believer and even more imitate Christ as you are being conformed to his likeness by the Spirit. But understand this. Even the very faith that we are exhorted to have here, understand that this faith is in and of itself a gift from God. It is not ultimately from us. Paul says our faith has been granted to us from the outside. And why is this so important? Because if your faith comes from within you, and it's not a divine gift fueled and empowered by the Spirit, you ought to have no confidence at all. Because you are weak, and you are beggarly, and you get knocked over very easy. And you grumble immediately when pain and trials come. Therefore, we want a faith that is gifted to us from God himself, not something we work up in and of ourselves. Notice what Paul says in Philippians 1.29. This actually shocked me when I pulled it up. I was thinking about this text in light of faith being granted to us. But he says something else that I had forgotten in the moment. Listen to what he says. Philippians 1, 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe, there it is, believing is a gift, faith is a gift, but also 
suffer for his sake. You see what Paul just did there? That is our entire sermon in one text. Paul is saying here that the faith which endures, which receives the word of God, which unites us to Christ, we might be saved. That faith and the fire, the context, the life of suffering and misery, all of it, it's from God. You have been granted faith and suffering, faith and the fire from God. And therefore be encouraged that if you belong to Christ, your faith will not fail because it is a gift from him. It will not fail because it cannot fail. He will not allow it. The Lord Jesus now ascended to the right hand of God in heaven. He will not allow you to not endure if you really belong to him. Do you know that? He prays for you. And do you think his prayers fail? Did his prayers fail when he told Peter, you will deny me. Satan is going to sift you like sand, but I have prayed for you. And when you turn, he doesn't say if you turn. No, when you turn, because I as high priest have prayed, you will be sustained, Peter. You will be sustained, saints, because of your high priest who is in heaven. The oil that inflames your faith will never run out. The flame might shine brighter from time to time, but nevertheless, where he has gone, you will be by faith, and Christ will not let it be otherwise. He commands what he wills of his people, and yet for his saints, he gives what he commands. As St. Augustine said, and therefore Paul can say to us with absolute confidence, and hear this word if you've heard nothing else, dear saints, Paul says, our Lord Jesus Christ will sustain you to the end. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.